That's Linda's fun. Meet me on the corner. Suffragette City a little bit later on uh, this morning. In the meantime, though, in the words of Edmund Burke, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Sometimes doing the right thing is very, very tough indeed, especially when it means standing up against the flow and being a whistleblower. My next guest is a former policeman, a whistleblower, and now campaigns to support others, especially in the fight against child abuse and uh, also uh, raising money, in fact, for a local cause as well. But uh, John Wedger, it's lovely to have you here in the studio. Thank you very much for oh, coming thank in. Thank you for having me. Uh, we'll talk about the walk, actually, because uh, you're going to be walking quite a few <laughs> considerable miles, actually. But sort of going back to, to your decision to become, to get into the force in the first place, why did you want, why did you think that the police was for you? Uh, Funny enough, I had a twin sister that she joined the police and she encouraged me to join. I didn't have any sort of inkling to do it, really. Um, but then I applied and I got through and as soon as I got in, she left. <laughs> but I, um, so how old were you when you I joined? was 24. So what had you done previously? Uh, I was um, a telephone engineer for British Telecom. I'd also trained as a commercial diver and I actually joined the police to become a diver. Um but what happened was I ended up doing detective work and it was just sold on me. I just loved it. After that, I could never go back. And I really got a lot out of it. So how, how quickly did you go into detective work since uh, joining? Within about two years. So what was your, your sort of day-to-day -day then as a detective? Uh, well, well, it varies because, I mean, the police is split between the uniform branch and the CID. And in most of Europe, it's two separate jobs. Whereas in the UK, everyone has to start off on the beat, as it were. Um, but the detective had a lot of freedom and I was never one to be part of a group. Mm. You know, I sort of, I, I, I struggle with regimentation and with discipline, really. I was always a bit of a, <laughs> a, a lone wolf with things. And um, I just saw how they worked and it, it was just something that really, really appealed to me. So what what sort of what sort of things were you were you working on? Because I'm and I meant I mean I mentioned you were a whistleblower and you, and you went into fighting child abuse. But when did that come in your career? Right, I'm glad you mentioned that. It was very very early on, and when you join the police, they sort of ask you what do you want to do. And there was a lot of the lads wanted to go into like they call it the TSG, like the riot squad and things like that. And I never, like I said, I fancied being a diver because I was a good swimmer. And I never really had sort of any aspiration to do anything. It was only when I was working in a rough part of South East London. And part of policing duties are that you have to be the jailer. And I was um, just looking after the prisoners, giving their food and everything else. And back then they could smoke and you'd take them out for a cigarette. Mm. And there was a fella in there and he wasn't too dissimilar to age to myself. He was a heroin addict and I got talking to him. I said, what, what's the heroin all about? Why are you doing it? And he said to me, listen, mate, he said, uh, if you had my life, you'd be doing it. And I went, what do you mean? Tell me. And he then went on to recount his life in the care system and all the, the abuse that he endured. And it, it was heartbreaking. And I gave him a cigarette and, you know, he shook my hand. He said, you know, thanks for listening. And so how, how do you feel, you know, when, when somebody is, is in the custody of, of the police and you've actually found out his story? Because, of course, you know, then, then so suddenly that person means a, a great deal... Uh, very differently to you because you look at them as a human being and you think well no wonder no wonder how do you how do you deal well, with that well well see what what happens is that when you look at policing it's a revolving door the recidivism recidivism rate in the uk is 75 to 80 percent it's a system that is not working and when you see that the majority of people that are in the prison system are usually byproducts of the care system and you think that all it, all it is with, with the courts, one thing I learned from dealing with the child abuse is that the family courts intervene, but they just prepare the children then for the juvenile courts, who prepare the children for the magistrates, who prefer, prepare them for the Crown Courts and ultimately for the coroner's courts. From cradle to grave, no one intervenes and breaks this cycle, and it's a cycle of abuse, and it does not work. And when when you... I remember years ago, it was about in the late 90s, early 2000s, they got Mayor Giuliano over from New York and he came up with a theory called the broken window theory. And what that was, was that if you've got an area of depravity uh, and it's run down and everything else, then smarten it up, clean it up and you will actually get rid of a lot of the local crime. So the drug dealers won't frequent it, that won't bring in the, the, the transient crime, the shoplifting. And from there, you won't then get the robberies and everything else. It's this escalation. But 
What he wasn't doing was taking it back to its inception. Why is someone on heroin? And when you find out that they're on heroin, because heroin is an analgesic, and a lot of um, heroin users, there'll be a connection, hand in glove, really, with abuse as a child. And it, not necessarily sexual abuse, but it could have been physical abuse and everything else. So it's a painkiller. There's a lot of pain there. We are not solving the problem. That's purely and the symptom. It really is. And if you go back, it all starts and ends with the children. If you destroy your children, then you are destroying society. And when you look at police and what they plough their money into, the child abuse commands. I went from one unit that was so heavily financed, but it was all to do with economic crime. You had all the resources you wanted. When I went on to the child abuse investigation teams, we had one car between a whole group of two, de two groups of detectives. We had hardly any overtime and the workload was so emotionally impactive and monumental, you couldn't cope. It was absolutely harrowing and unfortunately a lot of officers then suffer from problems like depression, PTSD. alcoholism, mm. and PTSD, exactly. And with the PTSD, the, the police refused to accept it. And um, what was said to me by a former policing minister, that the moment they accept PTSD, then they're opening Pandora's box. Now, so what are you saying that that, that is that there's still that refusal to yeah. accept it? Oh yeah, deliberate, deliberate, and it's. I mean, I'm, you know, not to go on too much about myself. I'm now litigating against the police for a campaign of bullying against me, which hopefully I'll get onto about why it occurred. Um, and part of that is you suffer a mental health detriment because um, I now speak with so many other whistleblowers that have been through what I've been through. And they push you. I mean, the bullying campaign, I call it the algorithm bullying. There's a certain amount of actions that they keep carrying out time and time again when you do whistleblow. We'll hear more about your whistleblowing yeah. in a couple of moments' time, actually. Uh, my guest this morning is John Wedger. He's a former policeman, as you've been hearing, a whistleblower and now campaigns to support others, especially in this fight against child abuse. You'll hear more from John in just a couple of moments' time after Roxy Music and Dance the Night Away. It's BBC Radio Oxford. But my guest in the studio is John Wedger. He's a former policeman, whistleblower, and now campaigns to support others, especially in the fight against child abuse. I mean, just going back, in fact, reiterating what you said, you went into the police about the age of, of 24. Yeah. Uh, you were very... You, you went, in fact, into... After a couple of years, you became a detective. And it was really somebody who who was a heroin addict who sort of changed your path within the police force yeah. because you were the jailer, you talked to them over a cigarette, got their story, and it turns out that he was a victim. This person was yeah. a victim of child abuse yeah. and the drugs was the symptom. And that's that was your turning point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you were talking about the huge emotional impact and I can't even begin to fathom how huge that must have been to actually be involved in child exploitation cases. Can, can, can you talk us through some of your experiences, though? Yeah, um, it all, the main thing began in about 2003, four. I was working on a specialist unit dealing with vice. And I was asked to um, lead an investigation into an allegation made by a girl when she was 12 that she was being worked as a prostitute. Um, what said to me, look, she's made about two to three allegations before. We don't really think it's going to go anywhere, but just see what she's got to say. So I went to see this girl uh, in a care home in, in sort of like the Midlands. And and she was, <laughs> I'm not denigrating, you know, lovely kid when I got to know her, but she was a bit of a horror. You know, she's very anti-police, everything else. But when I got to know her, we started talking. And at the, at the, the same time, I was a single parent of four children. Um, two, two of my oldest children weren't even mine and there was problems with their mother but they were going to go into the care system but didn't, they stayed with me and I brought them up, you know, and uh, they're grown men now but so I, I had a lot of understanding about the care system and everything else so um, I could sort of understand this, this girl's anger anyway, um, the confidence was built and um, she started to tell me a story and it was, her mother was a drug addict and it was um, a woman that was actually selling the drugs to her mum and another prostitute who started to groom her. And she would groom her, take her and brush her hair and say, you look beautiful. And then introduce her to, um, started off introducing her to like small drugs like cannabis and then pornography. And then it went on to the harder drugs like heroin and crack cocaine. 
So you've got a little girl now, 12 years old, taking crack cocaine. And she would then take this um, young girl to various hotels in central London where she would pimp the girl out. But not only that, she would then get this little girl to get her friends involved. And it, it's, it's, so the more you looked into it, the more you found. And it was sort of like day by day, it was multiplying. So I'd go and see the other girl, same story. And she'd say, well, it's not just me, there's two more, two more. Two. And one of them, the youngest one was nine years old. So it went from nine to 14. And they were all kids that were subject to care orders. And they, they were all over London. It was absolutely massive. 15 years ago, I, I can't really remember either there ever being a Rotherham, there ever being a, a Bullfinch, but it was absolutely prevalent. In- yeah, and Kat, what it was, when I researched it, I looked back and I went through records and, and I went through children found in red light areas. It had been going on for a long, long time. Well, why didn't the public know about it? Well, the thing is, the police have specialist units and they act as gatekeepers. So... Um, the allegations might be made to a normal cop on the street, but it will go to a specialist team. Now, they will control the information. So they will control what, what, what gets out and what doesn't. And I was about to find out why the public didn't know, because what happened was that there were well-meaning social workers as well. And one of them come to me and she said, look, John, we need help. And this was in South London. She said, we are getting children coming to us. And we've had them coming for many years and they are working as prostitutes. Their health is so bad because of their lifestyle, you know, the health implications. And some of them, there was no protection. They was, they was infected with all sorts of life-threatening diseases. And she said, we, we've asked the police to attend our meetings. They never come. So I drafted a report and it was factually based and it was concise. And it was all to do with my findings. And I submitted it. And then all of a sudden it was like, you know, I'd, I'd punched a hornet's nest and I was summoned before. I won't go in too much about it because it's going through the court mm, system at yeah, the moment. please don't. But I was summoned by a, a very senior officer who, who basically threatened me. You've got to shut your mouth. And, and really what it was to do with, it was to do with corporate reputation. The public must never know what's coming out. And I was removed and the operation was massively scaled down. And um, they never appointed, you know, for quite a few years any other sort of um, officers to look into it and that's why that's how they do it and um, I mean I officially whistle blew in 2014 and I made allegations of corruption against the Met Police for what was going on. That was a huge decision for you to make I should imagine I mean whistle blowing against yeah. such a, a huge yeah. uh, body. And, and then what happened was the campaign of bullying against me was just so phenomenal. I mean, I, I was see what I was threatened with. I, I was threatened with you'll you'll lose your job, your children, your home if you ever mention a word of this. And then when I did whistleblow in two thousand and fourteen, I nearly lost my home because they stopped paying me. My job, they threatened me, well, served me with papers, gross misconduct papers, which is a twofold thing. One is that there's an internal investigation for misconduct. Secondly, they send the papers to the Crown Prosecution to prosecute you. So I had three lots of them. Each one contained three offences. So there was nine attempts to prosecute me. Right. One of the copper's biggest fear is going to prison. So I still had young children at home. Um, and then, uh, of course, so uh, the other threat was you lose your children. Now, um, I'll go out the timeline if I mention it now. If I can mention it in a second, what happened. But there was an attempt to sort of um, undermine the placement of my youngest child as well. But it wasn't just me. At the, at the same time, I was put in touch via an MP with um, Maggie Oliver. Now, Maggie Oliver was the police um, officer in Manchester who exposed the Rochdale cover-up. Um, and there was the, the drama, Three Girls, the BBC did a dramatisation of her work and also, I think she's been on Big Brother recently as well. So mm. she's actually attained a bit of sort of media status now. And I went to see her, and her story was identical to mine. Honestly, you couldn't get a cigarette paper between the differences. And she said, they'll come for you, and they'll try and prosecute you. And this is what they'll do you for. And her words were totally predictive, because it's exactly what they did. I then met with another brave whistleblower called Lenny Harper. Lenny Harper exposed the children's home in Haute de la Garenne in Jersey, and he said exactly the same. And the bullying against him was exactly the same as the bullying against me. Um, and it just went on from there. And see, the more they, they attacked me, the more I, I, I dug my heels in. And I started 
doing a lot of work with victims and survivor groups. Mm. Um, and, and that's what you're doing locally, actually. Yeah, yeah. And with, it with is, the lake community. Yeah, the lake community. I mean, the, the the one I've worked with for many years is a man called Bill Maloney. He's a South East Londoner, been in the care system himself, and um, the victims and survivors know this man very well. He's 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 sort of very much a hardcore anti-abuse activist and really stands up for the rights of of the uh, abuse and survivors, victims and survivors. Sorry. Um, and then from there, I got in touch with Chris Lambriano. And Chris was a member of the Cray Twins gang. He gained notoriety many years ago for his involvement in that. But he's a committed Christian now, and he does a lot of work with the lay community, which is local, and it is a rehabilitation centre. Mm. You're doing a walk, actually. Yeah. I'm, I'm, we've got to go to Mindful travel. We've got to go to travel, actually. And, and uh, I, 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 you've got to write a book. <laughs> you've got John Wedge, right. you have to write a book. Would you write it for me? <laughs> 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 I'll dictate it. <laughs> uh, we'll talk. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you. You're doing a, a walk in London to Manchester. Walking from London to Manchester, I've got a Just Forgiving page. Uh, which is? Which is it's Just Forgiving, but put in the surname Wedger, W-E-D-G-E-R. Mm -hmm. Desperately need to raise enough funds to cover the expense of the walk and what's left over goes to Darren and the group at the Lay Community for their brilliant work in, in sort of helping the lives of abuse victims. It's great. Thank you so much for coming no, on. I mean, no, obviously you're still picking up the pieces of, of these victims of, of child of course, abuse as yeah. well. And John, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. No, thank you, Kat. And write that book. Yes, please. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> BBC Radio Oxford. 